The market is thus an institution that allocates scarce goods and services to those most able to pay. I want to hammer at that. The market is like a rationing system. Rationing is if you don't have enough for everybody who wants, you have to decide, well, we don't have enough for everybody, who's going to get it? That always happens whenever there is scarcity of anything for any reason. You have to ration it. There's not enough to go around. The way markets do it is they say, let all the people who want it fight each other for it, bid for it. How much will you give me? How much will you give me? And the price gets bid up according to however much wealthy people are in the neighborhood and want to get whatever it is that's scarce. So it ends up being rationed, it ends up being distributed to those who are willing to pay the most. The richest amongst us who really don't care what the price of something is. But let me ask you to use your own moral judgment. What kind of morality says that the way we distribute what's scarce is to the richest people amongst us? I would go so far as to suggest that no modern moral, whether it be religious or not, no modern moral system would justify, would excuse this way of doing it. Let me be as stark as I can. Suppose the scarce item was milk. Would we allow the wealthy to bid up the price of milk so that only they could afford it? So that they would get the milk and feed it to their cat at home? Whereas the family with 10 children, the poor family has to do without milk for its kids because it can't play the market game. It can't keep buying as the price goes up. So you'd have to ask yourself, if you have moral commitments in your life, whether the market is really the way you want scarcity. And let's remember, scarcity can happen because it doesn't rain enough. Scarcity can happen because there's a war in a foreign country. Scarcity can happen, these days we hear about supply chain disruptions, maybe a pandemic. There are thousands of reasons why shortages occur. Maybe companies deliberately hold back on the production of supplies of goods and services. Knowing how markets work, they'll bid the price up. The old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today to transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton, Amanda Smith, and Zachary Marlowe. And together, we can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. Society. Okay, we're live. Today is an extremely special episode, and I don't want to waste a second uh, belaboring this with a heavy intro because we have the one and the only, the godfather of anti capitalism, Richard Wolf, the professor. And uh, Rich Richard and I were, I was very lucky to meet with and interview Richard for my film that I've been working on this last year, shooting all over the place. He was the last interview, and I just thought that was such a feather in the cap. It was such a joy to meet and connect with him. The topic we got into was essentially the market, and we just he just absolutely demolished it, blew it up from every angle, and uh, we were just kind of getting into the good stuff when we were uh, rather politely but definitely interrupted by uh, private security from Blackwater or BlackRock, uh, one of those big companies. I'm serious. This actually happened. We were interrupted yes, before we yes. really got into the good stuff. And uh, <laughs> so I would like to see this as kind of a continuation of that conversation. You know, Rick, you're always like talking about the problems, it seems like. And this show really ultimately is about pushing people into talking about solutions. And so in this conversation of questioning the market and just kind of 
you know, you've been talking about this for so many years, so many decades that we really need to just move beyond this stuff. It doesn't work clearly, you know, and when we talk about the market, I think one of the essential aspects of this show and what we're trying to talk about is to move beyond the market, but also money, which is really intertwined with that. And so I would really love to get your perspective on that and ultimately kind of push us in the direction of like, where are we going? Where, you know, how far can we take this? What is a system that's truly beyond capitalism look like? And then we can get into the steps to how to get there. But take it away. All right. All right. Thank you very much, both for the invitation and for that introduction. Um, let me just devote a couple of minutes to picking up on your point. I would have liked years ago to do exactly what you're proposing to do, uh, namely look at the solutions. Where do we go from here? What's next? But I had to face the fact, it was difficult for me, being a professor in the university, which I've done all my life, and dealing with students in economics classes, which I've done all my life, I had to face the fact that before we could get to solutions, I had to do what seemed like a mountain of work to try to get people over and beyond their, and I use this word advisedly, their entrancement by capitalism, their sense <laughs> uh, that it's just the greatest thing since sliced bread, even better, and that is just wonderful. It's just the sum total of everything the human race ever wanted. And to be critical or to disagree <laughs> means you're either very stupid or very evil or some unpleasant combination of these two qualities. I, I had to work through that. What I'm fascinated by and very happy about is that we are now more and more on finding that that's not necessary. People have figured that out. You know, they look around themselves, they look at their parents, their friends, their, you know, the, the people they live with. They look at the prices at the gas station or at the grocery store, all the things we could talk about. And I know you do and that I do. And they don't need us anymore, which is wonderful. They're figuring it out in the daily life they have to lead. And so you ask and many are, are asking us, OK, now. Capitalism sort of stinks. Where do we go from here? I, I don't want to overdo it. There are still large numbers of people who haven't figured that out yet. I, I, I don't want to minimize. That task is still important to be done. But I'm really gratified that we can go beyond it. All right, next point. Going beyond it means that we recognize that other people have already tried that. We are not the first ones to figure out that capitalism is not where we want to be. We want to do something better. And the movement has a name that has been trying to do that for at least 150 years, roughly. And that movement has a variety of names, but the best known is the word socialism. Better or worse. And people mean a whole array of different things. I'm not going to get into that part, although that's worth discussing, because what really motivated most of the people was they wanted to do better than capitalism. If I had to ask, if I had to answer the question, which I have had to do, what is the difference between socialism and 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 capitalism? Sort of what is socialism? The only answer I've been able to come to that covers it, it's a yearning to do better than capitalism. That's really what that is. And they, those, all those people in various countries, because it is remarkable that in every country where capitalism arrived, starting in the 18th century in Britain and then spreading all over the world, in every country, socialism was three steps behind. It came with it the opposition, the criticism, the yearning to go beyond is now as globally dispersed as capitalism. I used to make a joke in my classes. The one thing that guarantees the near future of socialism is the power of capitalism because it has always brought its critics right along with it. And so we have an experience the socialists made a decision, and now I'm going to simplify horribly, 
but I want to get to where I think we need to go, and that's what you asked me about. So bear with me on the simplification. The socialists decided that the way forward was to take advantage of the fact that capitalists are relatively few in number. The people who are actually capitalists, who use money to make more money by hiring people, exploiting them and all of that, that's a tiny percentage of every modern society. It's not even 1% in this country are employers. The other 99% of us are basically either employees or relatives or children, but basically employers are a tiny part of the population. So the socialists got it into their head, smart that we're the majority, basically. We, the representatives of wanting to do better, uh, we don't have the money, the the capitalists have that, and we don't control the media, and we don't control the government, but we have the people. So let's do the following. Let's use the people, push like crazy for universal suffrage so that everybody can vote, and socialists were always in the forefront of giving the vote to poor people, to women, to all those who had been excluded, as in this country, uh, all those groups were at the beginning. Push for universal suffrage, and then having the people, we will seize the state, we'll capture the government, we'll either do it with the mass of people by voting, or if they try to stop us, we'll do it with the mass of people by revolution. And they disagreed about it, they debated all that. But the idea was to have the state come in and the state would begin to make a better society than capitalism had ever done. The state could give everybody who's a child a free public education. That had to be fought for. Limit the working day that the capitalist imposed on you from 12 or 10 hours to 8 hours. And all the modern assumptions about what the workplace is had to be fought for by getting the state to intervene with a law, a regulation, and so on. And so they decided to go for that. In Russia, they did it by revolution. In Western Europe, they did it by election, and so on. So they did all that. They got the state in there. To this day, the state you know, creates a minimum wage. The state creates social security. The state does all of these things. And it's often by conservatives called socialist, which which is wrong, but it's understandable because it was the socialists who brought uh, all of that stuff. Even when it was done by a capitalist, it was because the capitalist was forced from below, like, like Roosevelt in the 30s and so on. But here's the problem. We've now had a century or more of socialists with strong positions in the government, but we haven't gotten beyond capitalism. We've made capitalism softer, less harsh, more supportive of people, true in many cases, but the basic power distribution and the basic wealth distribution is as bad or worse than it was before all this socialism and the state got involved. Okay, so here comes the punchline. Something the socialists did, or maybe something they didn't do, means that I had to say what I just said, that we just haven't fixed this system. We still have capitalism. It's less harsh. It's, it's a little bit less unequal although we are really challenging that these days here in the United States especially. And by the way, that's a very important weakness of American capitalism. Uh, It even terrifies the the, the leading capitalists who know that there's a very dangerous way to build a society. I've heard Warren Buffett, not just publicly, but privately, he's scared to death about his own wealth is at play here. He's going to be, you know, out the window if this, goes crazy. And it is, in his view, going crazy. It did with Trump. It is with Biden. He's very worried. Anyway, uh, the problem, changing the state, bringing the state in, was good, helped in many ways, 
but it did not solve the problems. That's why we are who we are, why we are doing what we are doing, and why there's an upsurge in this country of unionization, of striking, of political movements of all kind, uh, of the audience that I enjoy, that you are building for yourself, and so on. All of that is, it didn't work. And I think the reason is, again, to be brutally blunt, the capitalists recognized the danger they confronted. And they figured out how to absorb enough of what the socialists wanted to kind of keep the lid on, to prevent it from going further. They compromised with the socialists. And the blame for that is as much on the side of the socialists as it is on the side of the capitalists who wanted this deal, the socialists. And by the way, there were splits among this. They didn't all want to go along with this. So, I mean, there are fights, but I don't have the time, although at another point, be worth talking about. So here we are. The question is, the socialist effort, whatever good things it accomplished, did not accomplish the big one. It didn't take us to a society that is fair, that is equal, that is democratic. If you go back to the French Revolution, the slogan was liberty, equality, fraternity, the American Revolution as democracy. We don't have any of those things. And, and, and capitalism promised them, and capitalism has failed to deliver them to this moment. My conclusion, and I'm part of a group of people, I'm not alone, I'm not the only one singing this song, as you know. But my conclusion is that what the socialists failed to make a priority and by the way, not all of them. Some of them understood this. That's the ones who taught me. But what, as a movement, what they failed to do was to understand if you just focus on what the state does, you're shooting only at the high level. You have to also target the low level, what we call in economics the micro level, not just the macro not just whether the government is more powerful than the corporate executive. Yes, no. you can argue that for the rest of the day. If you don't change the foundation of the economic system, you won't get going beyond capitalism. That, that's the big story. And let me then explain what we mean. The, bo the, the bottom, and by bottom I mean the enterprise, the workplace, where where goods and services are produced. My shirt, uh, this computer, uh, the telephone, the hot dog, whatever. We have workplaces to produce everything. And, you know, the labor force in this country is counted at about 160 million people. So in other words, half our people, that's what they do as adults. And a huge part of the, of the others that I didn't count you know, we have a population of 320 million, roughly 160 million, a little bit more than half are uh, workers. The rest of us are mostly children, elderly, institutionalized people, and the peculiar workers who are not working at a workplace recognized, but are working somewhere else. And of course, I mean women who stay home, work their rear ends off like everybody else, but in economics are... are not counted, they're like they're not there. Like children are raised all by themselves and houses are taken care of all by them. And that's changing too because women can't stay at home anymore uh, the way they once did. But if you take the adult population of the United States, the 160 million working people, they are doing their work in a very particular and peculiar organization, whether it's a factory, an office, or a store. The organization is a tiny group of people at the top, the owner of the enterprise, the partners who started it or who stole it or who inherited it, it doesn't really matter, or the board of directors if it's a corporation, a tiny group, you know, boards of directors, 10, 15 people mostly. This is a tiny group of people in every factory store and office, whether it's 
profit or non-profit, which is a, a fakery anyway, but you know, for another day, um, <laughs> what we have is a highly unequal distribution of power and of position and of wealth inside every workplace. The people at the top, who, they make the key decisions. For example, what are we going to produce here? What? What good? What service? Number two, what technology are we going to use to do that? Number three, where are we going to do it? Here in New Jersey or over there in Shanghai? Number four, what price? And in a, in a country suffering inflation, there's a big one. What price are we going to attach to whatever the hell it is we produce? There is no inflation unless the tiny minority of people who are employers make the decision to raise the price. The first answer to the question, why do we have an inflation, is because the 1% employer class decided it's profitable for them to do that. If they don't decide it, you don't get an inflation. It has absolutely nothing to do with the Federal Reserve's decision about the money supply. That's why for the first 20 years of, of this century, 2000 to 2020, the Federal Reserve pumped money into this economy and we had no inflation. Over the last two years, it pumped money in and we did. Conclusion, what the Fed does is a completely different thing. It's related, but to blame the Fed or the monetary system for inflation is doing corporate America the biggest ideological favor you could imagine. And they don't even pay you. The favor is you're avoiding pointing the finger at them. If they don't choose to raise the price, which they didn't between 2000 and 2020, we didn't have an inflation. Not mentioning them, not asking, why are you raising prices? To which the only honest answer is, we do that for the same reason we do everything else. It either helps the bottom line or it doesn't. In other words, we do it because it's profitable. In order to avoid having to admit that, which would hang them out to dry politically, we all, well, I mean, I don't, but I don't want you in the future to listen to, 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 to nonsense about supply chain disruptions or all the other fakery whose purpose is to distract us from what that 1% of the employer class chose to do. Anyway, my point again, we allow a tiny group of people what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, what price to attach, and then what to do with the revenue that comes in when you sell whatever it is you produce. In other words, to decide who gets what share of that revenue. And then we seem as a nation to be surprised that when you have a tiny group of people in charge, you know what they do? They take most of it for themselves. Hello, what did you expect? They're not all Mother Teresa. And if you look closely at Mother Teresa, she wasn't like Mother Teresa either. These are fantasies. <laughs> so you have to go a little step further. And here's the step. And once you understand the logic, it's no big deal. You got to stop this organization of the enterprise. I mean, that's it. I don't want to suggest it's simple. It isn't. But the basic idea, like all basic ideas, is in fact simple. If you mm -hmm. democratized the enterprise, there's your slogan. Good for the American public, which believes that democracy basically is like apple pie, motherhood, and strawberries. It's wonderful. So if you democratize the enterprise, what would it mean? You convert the enterprise into a democratically organized community, just like the community where we are residents, you know, where we live. We are a community of people at the workplace. And we're going to run our affairs in both locations democratically. One person, one vote, majority decisions decide. We decide as a group at the factory or the office or the store what we will produce, what technology we'll use, where we'll do the production, what price we will attach. For the first time, prices will be a social decision. 
We all have to live with the prices. How we dare allow a tiny group of people to decide the prices we pay, even in the American mentality, shaped as it is by the forces we all know, people do understand somehow that an inflation is shafting them. That's one of the reasons there has to be the hoop de doodle about dealing with it, because if you don't, it looks like you are not dealing with uh, too dangerous. Republicans and Democrats, therefore, have to pretend, A, that they know what's going on, and I can assure you, knowing a bunch of them, they do not, and that they have an idea how to solve it, and they, even fewer of them have any clue about that, um, nor do they care. I mean, it's not that they're missing this. They, they could care less. Anyway, so my solution is that the revolution, what the socialists glimpsed but never put brought to the front of their program and their suggestions is to change the organization of the workplace. And what's in it for the mass of people is not only big changes at the top of the economy, but very immediate changes in your life. Going to work is not the going to sit in some cubicle doing what some jerk tells you to do because that jerk has a master's degree from the, the, the College of Perpetual Drinking. You know, none of that. We don't have that problem anymore because you're going to be part of what runs the enterprise. You're going to, and you don't have a choice. That's not voluntary. You want a job, your job always has two descriptions. The particular task you're being asked to do and your participation in running the enterprise. You have to do both. I mean, if you get sick or something, of course, but you're basically now, the world is different. You have a different relationship to the thing we call work. And that means you're going to develop skills you never had before. We're going to have to change our educational system to give everybody the idea you're going to be in charge. What we faked we were interested in, we're going to actually do. We're going to give a rounded education. There's not. I went to Harvard. You know, you know what they told us the first day I ever got to Harvard as an undergraduate? We went to a meeting. And the president of Harvard, whose name uh, I forgot, but the president he addressed us in a big room for freshmen the week before school started. You know, I was 17 years old. I, what did I know? So I sat there, and in, in those days, they wouldn't let women into the building. Women mm -hmm. had to go up the, yeah, seven blocks up to a place called Radcliffe College, and that's where all the women, they had their orientation separate from us. Because, of course, having men and women together for these religiously besotted folks was too scary and too dangerous, so we were kept separate. Now, so the, 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 wow. the, the, the pre yeah. The president of Harvard addressed us. He said, gentlemen, he knew what he didn't have to say, just gentlemen, no ladies and gentlemen, just gentlemen. Gentlemen, look at the man on your left, which we all dutifully did. Look at the man on your right. We were very happy because he was calling us men, but we were 17 years old where it's still exciting to be called a man. And he said, one of them is going to be a senator and the other one is going to be a captain of industry. I want you to all understand, here at Harvard, we train people, here it comes, to rule the world. Then he sat down for the effect. And we all sat there trying to take in, as 17-year-old boys, what in the world had just, what had happened here. But that mentality is there all the time, all the time. You know, and it's part of the culture. It's why people who go to school in some slum corner of Chicago don't, would never imagine running anything because they have been trained from birth that that's not where their fit is. It's like you were in a medieval place and the local priest told you, you're going to be standing behind the oxen in the field. That's what God wants you to do. And what are you going to do? Question God? You're not nuts. You, you understand. The priest has just figured out who you are and where you're going. We had the same thing. We just didn't call it God, but it was the same story. Anyway, that's my solution. And everything that I do is, is really designed to bring people to where they can hear that and think about it and then hopefully join in figuring out how we do that, what the particular shapes of it are going to be. 
because I mean, nobody can read the future. I can't tell you what's going to happen any better than the next person. But I know that I'm confident that if we can make that change, we are really because remember, before capitalism, feudalism and slavery, remember this about them. In slavery, a very few people are masters and a very large number of people are slaves. In feudalism, a very few people are lords, and a very large group of people are serfs. And in capitalism, a very few people are employers, and a hell of a lot of us are employees. If you notice something similar, stay with that insight. Let it roll around your head. If you want an economy to serve the people, you got to put the people in charge. And this way of democratizing the enterprise is the only way I know how to do that. I just got to say, I just love hearing you talk. You're like a, you're like a stand-up comedian of, uh, of, of anti-capitalism. You always make me laugh. It's like, you know, yeah. I, I tell this to people who say that one of the people I studied, and I mean, I really studied, I watched his shows a hundred times was Richard Pryor. Hmm. Whatever you get in the way of, of humor and play, even moving the body. I, I studied him like, you know, some young genius blues player sitting there watching B.B. King or Albert King or any of the other great blues players. And just we can definitely there. get into the blues, too. But yeah. uh, so well, there's so many points that I wanted to pick up in there. But I basically like my my overall point of like kind of going beyond the market sort of mechanism, the operating system of our society. So we in this organization and this movement are essentially advocating for a transitional structure that is based on creating a network of communities and cooperatives that are self-organized together to produce the things that people need, to give people universal services, access to what they need, and to create a new basic a mode of production that is based around sustainability. So there's so many points in it, and I just got to direct viewers to just dig deeper into our content. We don't have time to inundate the professor here, or sorry, Rick, here with our whole sh shebang. Right. But essentially, we're entering a very different world uh, in terms of what technology can do in terms of automating away jobs entirely. And then the greatest uh, point of interest and point of necessity is to adapt very rapidly, like today, like yesterday, like 10 years ago, to the needs of our changing climate, to the, the intensification of climate change. I saw uh, an article today buried in bullshit articles on there about how we are inches away from crossing these five major tipping points you know, that will essentially doom life on earth. And so we need to transition so rapidly that I, so, I sort of fear that even our own transitional platforms are perhaps not quick enough for us to change society rapidly enough. So what is truly needed is this very rapid, very quick, and uh, very synchronized uh, coming together of the people to create a totally new system that is based around democratic principles certainly but around the needs of our planet the needs of the warming climate the needs of habitat regeneration and ultimately the market process of you know, of consuming things in an extractive way and then selling them to people regardless of how that's organized seems to be a completely unsustainable structure yeah um i, I mean i agree with everything you you've just said i let me pick it up in a slightly different way and and stop me if this is not where you want to go the decision of the United States and Western Europe to apply sanctions against Russia over the war in the Ukraine. Um, and, and this is separate from whatever you think about the Ukraine war. That's not where I'm going with this. But I want to, I want to direct everyone's attention to two things. Number one, the European Union alone has committed $500 billion dollars to fight that war against Russia in Ukraine, $500 billion. Just to give you an idea, the GDP of Ukraine, the total value of output of goods and services of Ukraine last year was $156 billion. So we're spent, Europe alone, I'm not counting the Americans, that's on top of it. Europe alone is gonna spend, but Europe doesn't have that. Europe's economic situation is worse than the US which isn't saying much. These are hysterical behaviors. You know how much the rest of Europe cares about Ukraine? Zero. They care about it as much as most Americans do who couldn't find it on a map. Stop, what is going on here? 
And I'll put that aside. Trump spent three or four trillion dollars that the government didn't have, more than in the past, having to borrow wild amounts of money. Biden has already spent more than that. Trillions and trillions of dollars that they don't have, that they borrowed against the future. You know who behaves like, and they already have an exploding national debt. You know who behaves like that? People who think, I got nothing to lose. Mm. It's over. I might as well try. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm sure none of you would do this, but suppose you knew that your life was coming to an end. You might do things with your credit card you would never otherwise have thought to do. Maybe in your fantasy, you once imagined the trip you would take if you knew it was coming to an end. The American government, the European, they are behaving in ways that are crazy. Last point. Everywhere in Europe, France, Britain, Germany, they are reopening coal mines and coal burning uh, entities to generate electricity because of what they did with Russia. They are, if you think we're near a tipping point, I got bad news for you. The coal that they're burning alone, it's going to pass the record of coal pollution that we had a few years ago. We thought we were going down. We'll go, what do you, you're, you don't care about the, the, the climate future. You don't care about the financial future. You are fighting a war about a place no one knows or cares about. What are you doing? Something is wrong, folks. You may be surprised at the capability we have to intervene, not because we're well organized. We're not. Not because we're clairvoyant. We're not that either but because the system we're critical of is in way worse shape than you can imagine. I'm not sure of what I'm saying, but I'm trained in this system. I've been watching it all my life. I've never seen this kind of behavior. I've never seen it. I know because, you know, if you go to the fancy Ivy League schools I went to, you know all these people. My classmate sitting next to me at Yale when I got my PhD, yeah, was a woman named Janet Yellen, okay? Hmm. So I know them all, they know me. I've never seen them act like that. They're crazy. They are behaving crazy, they're talking crazy. And maybe, maybe something explains this that I've missed, perfectly possible. I would urge you to keep open that things may go really, because you spoke this way, things may go way faster than any of us are ready for. And I mean at the drop of a hat. Well, we really know that, you know, banks can create money and the Federal Reserve creates money in ways that they don't essentially have to pay it back. The real borrowing of the future is expending the resources of the earth and taking them out of there. So Putin gave a speech the other day that he basically said the uh, the age of um, basing our decisions based upon how much money we have is coming to an end. And we're going into the age of basically basing our economics upon how much resources we have. And as not just climate change, but as you're pointing out here, just the craziness of the capitalist system and its death throes increasing and creating scarcity that we can't even, you know, that is totally artificial, which I would say is the central component of capitalism. Well, you know, Ch China is the biggest country by population. India is right up there with it. Russia is the biggest land mass of any country on Earth. Talk about resources. You're done. If the, if the fight is based on resources, then we know why our leaders are acting crazy, because it's over. Mm. You know, I don't know if you, if you follow this, but a vast majority of the countries in the world have lined up with Russia and China on Ukraine, not with the West. Mm. We are with a few countries, you know, Japan and Australia and Western Europe, and that's it. And that doesn't run the world anymore. It wasn't just Queen Elizabeth who died. The whole empire of the West is dead. She just, you know, <laughs> symbolizes it. But it's the same story. You know, you, the symbolism of that monarchy. Hmm. Do you ever wonder, how do these people do all this stuff? Because it's the last vestige of that empire they have. Be very careful. We're doing that too. We're, we don't have a queen around whom to focus it. But we are looking for shreds of something to hold half of the hoopla against Russia. 
around Ukraine is to keep going the image that we are in charge. We decide what to do. It's all over. These are hysterical people who are very upset that they had to come to power at a time when it's a bad news they have to deliver to the people. So they're determined to find some good news. And the British are determined to have a coronation and a funeral that makes it look like the passing of Elizabeth matters. That's, you know, it's just, it's sad. But it's a sadness we should learn from. But it also means, and and I want this to be optimistic. I am an optimist. The American people are being put through a ringer that is opening them up in a way I never foresaw. You are doing very important things with your website, alongside many of the rest of us, talking to that openness, giving it a push, giving it something to chew on, letting it know that there are lots of us out here. You aren't alone. You aren't the only person in Western Oklahoma who thinks like this. (laughs) Well, I I, I always pick Oklahoma. You know why? Uh, The state in America where the largest number of socialists hmm. won elections into the state legislature of all the 50 states is Oklahoma. Interesting. I've got it a was, lot of anarchist friends in Oklahoma. Yeah, it was a, it was a bastion a weird place. of socialism, uh, of a kind of a, you know, prairie sort of mentality, but very strong, very strong. So I don't pick Oklahoma out of nothing. I pick it because it has this history in us. But I do believe that we are, I am seeing things that I was not trained to expect. And the people that train me are the same one that trained Janet Yellen or Paul Krugman or Joe Stiglitz or any of the others, all of whom I know because we come out of the same old boy network that runs the economics profession. Not that that's much of an achievement, but you know, they're the the people who run it. Yeah. I, th- I think it's really interesting, too, how you're just kind of saying that everything just seems to be escalating a lot quicker now than, uh, you know, than every than than a lot of people expected. And I think that's one of the main reasons why a lot of people are kind of waking up to just the inefficiencies and the and the flaws within the capitalist system, essentially. And uh, and and and. I think the longer it goes on, the more and more difficult time or people are going to have ignoring yep. things like that. Like me in particular, it's kind of interesting because I live in San Diego and San Diego is, you know, for the most part, it's a pretty, pretty wealthy area. It's in pretty good shape out here. And so, so we, here in San Diego, we don't really have a lot of people who are uh, really actively kind of, uh, you know, pursuing, you know, these, these mindsets and goals and things like that are really kind of part of this movement. But, um, you know, I go to other parts of the country, occasionally like Portland, and uh, they've got the real, real issue with homelessness up there. I didn't really realize how, how dire the situation was in the Northwest with all the homelessness in Portland. And uh, I I think pretty much everywhere from the Bay Area going all the way up to Seattle, and maybe even parts of Canada now. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it was a lot to handle going up there and coming from a place like San Diego where we're kind of in this little bubble, but then you kind of step outside of it and you're like, whoa, there's a lot of people out here who are really having a difficult time these days. And and it's all these little cracks are starting to show, you know, and, and I think people, they start to see enough of these little cracks and they start wondering exactly what it is, you know, that's going on. They know something isn't quite right. You know, they, they have a feeling, well, you know, there's some, in, some incentives here that are off or the system just doesn't function properly, but, but they're not exactly sure it, why it is, you know, and what those mechanisms are and, uh, and, and what the solutions are going forward. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons why we love your work so much, especially with cooperatives. It's one of the things that we really advocate and uh, want to promote. And, uh, and it kind of makes a lot of sense too. Essentially what we're doing is we're taking, you know, the idea of democracy that we've value so much within our within our you know government and our social uh you know uh government system and we're applying it to where we spend the majority of our adult lives which is in the workplace (laughs) you know and you'd think that we would have done this you know a hundred years ago or something but but no we're finally starting to catch up with this whole thing and hopefully it's not too little too late you know and uh but i have a lot of fears as well with with the uh you know climate crisis accelerating now they're calling the 
start they're starting to call it climate breakdown, which in my opinion is a far more uh, you know, it's a far better term to describe what's actually happening with the climate. It's, it's literally breaking down this, the systems and structures that, that humanity depends on to provide the things that our economy depends on, you know, such as food and water and energy and, you know, raw materials for housing and building and goods and everything else. Those things are literally starting to you know, the, the systems are starting to break down because our environment is not cooperating. Any, and it's a scary time we're living in. I, I have a lot of hope, too. But on the other hand, I'm very, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that we might have done a lot of irreversible damage. And now it's kind of to a point of mitigating and kind of adapting, you know, as opposed to being able to reverse all of the damage that we've done 100 percent, you know, and uh, and that's kind of one of my main fears going forward. You are not safe. You know, the COVID did that. This government didn't take care of us. That's a very deep understanding that you will find in people who don't understand anything else. They know that. They know that. And and very now, good point. And now to get this inflation, to go to the store and discover that the crappy chicken you're buying cost you twice what that crappy chicken cost you less. It, you know, it, it's like every day it's being pushed into you. And then you add the store, the fires, the droughts, the, the, the flooding and all the rest. You know, you, you, are, you are taking the American working class, the COVID, the crash, the inflation, now the rising interest rates with an indebted population that is doomed by this. It's too much. You can't do that. If I could scare you, my first language is German. My mother was born in Berlin. I speak fluent German. Okay. Nice. My mother, my mother taught me as I was growing up. In Germany, they thought they were inheriting the world. In the second half of the 19th century, they were the great challenge to the British Empire. The only other challenger, the United States. And it was kind of a race between the Germans and the United States as to who would kind of overtake and displace the British. That was the way everybody understood. The Germans were frugal. The Germans saved my, my family. You know, they studied. They went to, to school. They became engineering types. That was the, the big thing was to be an engineer and all of that. And and they put aside money and, and my memory of my grandparents and, and I, mean, I was born in Ohio I'm not for me I'm the American but they are all Europeans and you put the German working class through a trauma they lost World War one that wasn't part of the German idea they were going to win everything and they had they lost World War one then in 1923 they had the worst inflation any Western country has ever had. In a period of eight months, the German mark, that was the name of their currency then, the German mark went from four to a dollar to four, ready? Trillion to a dollar. That's an right. inflation. My mother told me stories that her parents, my grandparents, the, the man who worked in a department store, the, the grandpa, would run home at the middle of the day at lunchtime, run home with a bag, a brown bag of money, and like a relay runner, hand it off to my grandma, who would run, I mean run, to the local food store to spend it, because if you waited till the evening, all that money would get you a stick of butter, because the prices were doubling every half hour. Wow. You know, so, and here's what it meant. The entire savings of every German family, which they had saved for a century, were gone. In a matter of weeks, those 50 years of savings were worth a pound of potatoes. That was it. Wow. And then, that's 1923-24. Then in 1929, the Great Depression hit in Germany like it hit here. Lost the war, lost everything in the inflation. Then you lost your job in the Depression. That's why they voted for Hitler. That's why they went that way. They, they were, you can't do that to a working class, it goes crazy. Now, in that craziness, it can go to the left. If you have the right leader, they, it'll go to the left. But it can also go to the right. In Germany, it went the way it went. I, I just right, wanted right. to uh, 
uh, advocate for Amanda, who's way too polite on this show. She never okay. speaks up. She needs Thank to you. get and in Amanda there. Amanda has an extraordinary head uh, uh, decoration there. <laughs> yes, we tr- <laughs> Lovely ears. try not to speak of that. They're my daughters. Well, uh, moving <laughs> on, I just wanted to say I love so much, Rick, that you propose a communal approach to organizing the workplace. I was so incredibly yep. refreshed when I learned that about your work. Uh, full disclosure, I only recently really delved in, and I was pleased to find that uh, there, there were a, a lot of more digestible terms to be uh, to be grasped, to be accessed, uh, which is something that I try to advocate for is, you know, uh, transparency and, and uh, accessibility. Um, and so in saying that, I think that it's worth noting that when you talk about uh, democratizing the workplace, uh, creating a democratic um, I'm sorry, democratic work model within the workplace. Uh, you're, you're essentially saying that by doing that, because we are the 99%, we are the laborers, we are the majority, then we would right. then influence our political structures to follow suit Absolutely. with that. Um, and in doing that, I think there's a greater implication, the fact that our workplace, um, or I should say our political structures mimic our, our workplace structures. Uh, and that just really solidifies the, the ever deepening contrast between competition and collaboration in our society. And the fact that capitalism is somewhat our say by design a non-democratic system so then of course the question is how do we achieve this democratic model within the confines of capitalism and so the the question i just really want to ask you and have been burning to ask you is can you would you uh, be so kind as to enlighten us on how cooperatives play a part in uh, democratizing our workplace and and is that also the answer to how society may reorient themselves with a communal way of living yeah, well, you, you bring up, you know, a, a wonderful collection of things. I want to particularly pick up that, yes, the, the model of, of democracy that we have in this country is the one at the workplace, because it's the one that we engage with every day, because we work mm-hmm. in a place. So our experience of democracy isn't the once a year going into that booth and moving the lever for, you know, jer- jerk A or jerk B. That's not... You know, <laughs> That's as important as, as 10 minutes. Meanwhile, every day, every week, we're going in and understanding how the world works, and it isn't that way. And, and of course, if you add to that that the leading politicians all come out of the capitalist workplace, mostly from the top, well, then they're just comfortable and normal in what they're used to, as anybody would be. Uh, I, but I, I am very hopeful, and, and let me give you a couple of reasons why. Uh, this last weekend, I, I gave a talk to a special conference of the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. You know, there is this federation that links all the co-ops. And it was about the collaboration, the whole conference was about the collaboration between worker co-ops and labor unions. That is happening now quietly, but very steadily. And this is very important. If you go back a century in America, unions like the Knights of Labor, the first national uh, union in America, back in the, right after the Civil War, the Knights of Labor, first powerful union, was remarkable, not only in being the first labor union all over the United States, it was national, but here's what it did in the 1870s. That's a long time ago. It welcomed and admitted to full membership women unheard of at that time. It welcomed and admitted to membership African Americans. They'd only been out of slavery for 20 years or less at that point, right? Unheard of. And the third thing that no one had ever heard of before, they advocated that they as a labor union wanted as their program to achieve a transition to worker co-op based industry. Whoa. Right? That's in a, first of all, that's American history. That's not coming from Europe. That's not coming from some communist or socialist. That's the, the you know, there it is. So it's kind of American and for some people that matters. So that's a good thing. But it's happening now again. The labor unions are beginning to realize we ought to think about what it would be like if we weren't always fighting an employer for better wages and working conditions, an employer who has every incentive not to give that to us, 
even when we win it, he has then every incentive to undo it in the next year or the next month. You know, we're in an endless struggle, which any union, if you know, will tell you, and, and we don't win it often. Suppose we had, we said, how different it would be if we were arguing for better conditions with ourselves, if we ran the enterprise, and we didn't have a constant adversary undoing. Why are we doing that to ourselves? Why don't we have as our goal, not right away, but as our long-term goal, a transition? And the minute you start thinking like that, well, why don't we get together with the existing worker co-ops, of whom there's a growing number, I can assure you of that. We get emails now every day from people all over the United States. How do I start a co-op? How do I start? Who do I talk to? Where do I get the money? How do we solve the problem? You know, which is nice. not what we do. And we, we, we refer them to others who can help them that way. But the interest is off the chart, right? So they're, they're talking about, you know, one of the big problems with worker co-ops is to get the startup capital. You know who has that? The unions, they have money. Whoa, what about that? What about work um, credit unions? Credit unions have a lot of money. Well, maybe they ought to be putting it into co-ops because they're a co-op of a sort. And so there are all kinds of efforts that are actually going on how to build a momentum and a movement. And now let, let me go out, out a little bit on a limb. I push them further. Here's what I want. I want a new political party. I want that new political party to be the voice of labor and worker co-ops. I want it mm. to say, you unions, you worker co-ops, you help us build this political party. You give us a place to have meetings, to put up our posters. You explain to your people why we offer an alternative to Republicans and Democrats, all of that. We, the political party, our job is to make the laws and the regulations that make it easier for a co-op to be formed, easier for a co-op to grow. And let me give you an example. Jeremy Corbyn, who was the leader of the Labor Party in England until, you know, he got bounced out a few years ago. But he had a program like this, which his, his first lieutenant, a man named John McDonald, wonderful guy. He loved to give a speech all over England, went like this. If we get elected, the first thing the prime minister will then do, would, would have been Corbyn, the prime minister, is to pass the following law. Any business in England can stay the way it is, no problem. But if you want to do any of the following things, you have to first give your own workers what's called the right of first refusal. That's a legal language. What this means is if you want to close your business or you want to move out of the country or you want to sell your business to another business or you want to go public and become a stock company, you can do all those things. But you first have to give your workers the right to buy you out and convert the business to a worker co-op. That'd be the first law we pass. Well, you know, the, then there were the snarky reporters who got back after they thought about it, went back to him and they said, yeah, that's all well and good. But where in the world are the workers going to get the money with which to buy out the company? And McDonald is a famous photo, leans across the lectern where he's speaking and he says, we will lend it to them. <laughs> nice. Well, you know, that's the answer. That is the, because what that means is that the government would step in and be the banker. And when, mm -hmm. you, when they, he was pushed, he said, we want to do it. And, and this argument, I would say, is the way we ought to go in the United States. His argument went as follows. We need the Brit British people to have a freedom of choice because we believe in that. It's democratic. They want to be able to choose. Do you want to work in a top-down business, a capitalist business, or would you rather work in a worker co-op? Would you rather shop from a capitalist business? Would you rather? And in order to have an intelligent debate and then a vote, you have to give people real experience with both. We don't have both. We have mostly capitalists and very little. So we have to develop the worker co-op for the purpose of a free choice of our people as to, wow, who's going to... What's the argument here, right? 
and the conservatives didn't know what to do, and they were being badly beaten whenever they could get this idea out, which is why they dumped Mr. Corbett, in my humble opinion. But who, go, who cares about that? We have these ideas, these plans. This is a plan for a political party that would have a base in the unions and the co-ops, and that they would be in, having in their interest to support such a party because it produces tangible changes in laws and regulations that make their lives better right away. Right. Just in the spirit of always going further and pushing, you know, right. to the best possible world, as you as you said earlier, that's the movement is to create something better. Uh, our ideas and platforms are essentially in to build power in as many forms as possible to bring in as many intersections with the climate movement, with the labor movement, with the social justice movement, to work together to create communal structures, to create housing structures, to create work structures, to create cooperatives as a transitional space between that, to essentially create little pockets of a moneyless society that is able to support itself in a transitional form, but also to nurture and develop the ideas, the innovations, the new conceptualities, you know, the new technology, the new, a, a totally new relationship with both nature, with technology and with each other. And so, uh, Rick, we're really about out of time here, but I want to kind of, as an outro, maybe I want to kind of bring you back to maybe that, that sort of, uh, optimism or that imagination that you had, you know, at the beginning of this ride of like going to that world that we could go to toward what I assume would, you know, would be your preference, preferential society would be a sort of moneyless and classless society, one that does not have that pyramidal structure at all. And I would just love for you to sort of, you know, even in this hypothetical, even if the world collapses tomorrow and the subways fall into the ocean, that that world that we could be living in, I would love to hear you just really go long there as you uh, lead us out here. And and I would love to have you on the show again any any time. Yeah, sure. you know? yeah. so like, fun. Let's do it again so it's not we're not constrained. It's one of the beauties of the internet. We, we, yeah, we have this way of functioning. Uh, one way to get in it, as little as 10 years ago, I, if you had said to me that I could be in the position I find myself in now, I would have said that's a wonderful fantasy. Thank you for telling me, <laughs> but no way on earth is that going to happen. I'm not, you know, we have 300,000 YouTube followers. I, I, I can't cope with what's going on. I really can't. I now have a team. I don't know if you know that. I have a half a dozen people full time working on and we raise enough money to to pay them proper. I mean, it's amazing what we're in. A That's position. awesome. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, and it all came to us. We didn't have the money nice. or the people to go out and get it. I'm not even sure we could have. But so right. here's the first thing. And I know we said it before. Things are changing faster than we know. We're going to, we think it's all slow and it is slow for, but then when it finally breaks, then things go very, very fast. And mm -hmm. I think in a way I've never felt before, we've got to start talking now about what to do when it breaks, because mm -hmm. at, when it breaks, we're going to be so busy and overwhelmed. We're going to wish we had 10 minutes. We'll be so too it, late. <laughs> yeah. It, it, now is the time for us. And that's why your question is really good to fantasize. I think we can do that. I think the Democratic and Party is splitting apart. I see that all around me. I see. I don't know if you're aware. The New York City Council is this far away from having a majority of the elected officials refer to themselves as socialists. A majority mm. already refer to themselves as progressives. The Republican Party, nice. I don't know if you're aware, doesn't exist here. I mean, people remember that there is such a thing, but it has no, it, it's gone. So this is a Democratic Party stronghold. Uh, the whole state is, but the, the, the city particularly. But the mayor can't do all kinds of crappy things he wants to do because he's completely hamstrung by the mm. socialist. And these are mostly, by the way, young women. These candidates, young women, and they're mostly with names that indicate they're either Hispanic or they're from other parts of the world. It's really remarkable. And they're winning elections where that's not the majority of the vote. I mean, they're, they're crossing the lines that used to block them because they were women or block them because they were, you know, minority women. And all, all of that is shifting and changing very quickly. So 
I, I love your idea. We appeal to people who have felt discriminated against, excluded, uh, blocked, thwarted. Come on. Unless you're very strange on the right wing, we're here for you. We're here for you. We want to build, uh, an, if I can, dangerous word, an ecumenical big tent of the people who have a, a legitimate grievance with capitalism. If we can share that, I'm more than willing to go on someone else's demonstration if he or she goes on mine. I, I believe in that. That's how you build alliances and coalitions. And the Republicans and Democrats are so corrupted by the money they depend on that we have an enormous open field. I almost want to go to the point of saying, if we don't do it now, it's on us. We have a chance. Yeah. We have it. The government is so busy, you know, fighting the Ukrainians or the Russians or the Muslims. I mean, it's, it's awful. But they're leaving us alone. And that's our chance. That's our chance. I don't know how soon we'll have this chance um, again. And I got to tell you, more and more around the world, people are becoming aware of something they didn't believe before, that there is an opposition. I used to go abroad, give talks from time to time, and people would say, well, are you a Marxist? And I said, well, I hate the question, but if you mean, have I read Marx and learned from him and respect what I learned? The answer is yes. If that's what you mean, then you can call me a Marx. So said, we didn't know there were any of those in America. And I had to laugh and tell them, oh, no, there's lots of us in America. You don't hear about it, and that's no accident. But now I don't get the question anymore. You know why? Because they're picking up through the Internet that there's lots of critics around the United States. They were getting that. Mm -hmm. And that's a sign of our maturity as a movement. We're growing. That's beautiful. And the system, and the system either, either acknowledges it or they're going to have to get out of the way. And then that's the way... And I think we can do that. And I'm not, you know, a, a glad hander. I haven't always believed this, but I believe it now. I believe it. I, I can't yeah, get awesome. over. And that conference in New York between the labor people, the unionists, and the, the, you know what was good about it? Not a lot of rhetoric, not a lot of posturing. Real questions. How do unions work with COA? How do we make our members understand why that's an important alliance to be? Just, just the right question. And he's, you know, Einstein once said, I love this. He said, the, the answer is never the problem. It's the question. He said, if once you ask the right question, it'll point you to where the answer. The trick is the question. You know, and that, these well, people right. figured that out. And they came from all over, including there was, I wish I knew that you were from, one of the most interesting speakers was a young man who's in a union of some sort in San Diego. He was very good. Hmm. Is it, uh, I, I, I know Patrick, I don't, I, I think you know Patrick, it's probably not Patrick Conley. Patrick Conley, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good, he's a good friend of ours. I know Patrick personally, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, great. no, I connected with him. Before the pandemic, I used to give, t speak around the country and, and, the Pacifica radio network, you know, they would bring me to San Francisco, to L.A., to Houston and you know, around and give talks to raise money for them. And then they they had a sister station or a substation in San Diego. So I gave a talk in San Diego and I gave a oh. talk in Santa Ana. Um, nice. And Patrick was all involved and I got to meet him that way. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, that's we're going to have him on our show sometime soon to go deep on cooperatives and the Knights Good. of Labor and all this history. He's great yeah. talking about that stuff. But Rick, I think we're coming up on time. Yeah, there's I, more. I, was more say, I think we're coming up on time. Um, <laughs> I, I, the, the thought that's in my head right now is just that there are more solutions than problems, that we're all being driven to this, that the, there's one problem that encompasses all of these, and it's called fucking capitalism. Yes. You know, yes. But there's many, many solutions. <laughs> there's many alternatives. There's many avenues for people watching, listening, realizing that the cracks in the sidewalk are going to swallow them all up soon enough that realizing the inflation and all these problems are driving them toward a common solution, a common imagination, a common yeah. dream of a better world. So Rick, yeah, we'd love to have you on anytime. Um, yeah. It's just been great. Yeah, Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 It's been a pleasure. What capitalism does is expand the market, make the market its central institution. 
in a way that slavery didn't, except for the slaves themselves who were bought and sold, and feudalism didn't. The market really becomes the basic way goods go from whoever produces them to whoever consumes them. The market is a mechanism in capitalism for the distribution of almost everything. But not literally everything. Let's remember, lots of things get produced in modern capitalist societies and distributed, but not by a market. I like to give the example of the Thanksgiving dinner, where mother makes, hypothetically, the turkey. She cooks it. She prepares the meal. She distributes the drumsticks to the various members of the family and friends gathered. But nobody gives anybody any money. Nobody buys and sells bits of turkey. Nobody buys and sells anything at the dinner. Even though goods are produced, services are performed, they go from the producer to the consumer, but markets are not used. Indeed, if mother would reach a drumstick to her son and say, please give me $5, the whole family would be shocked and horrified, and they might give each other the following lesson. In this family, we do things for one another because we love each other. We don't buy and sell from each other. And bringing the market into the family would disrupt the loving relationships we try to create. To which a modern critic of the market might say, gee, if the market disrupts love inside the family, maybe it's not such a good institution outside the family either. What a great man. That's what it's all about, right? Bringing love back into our society. And that's what we're working on creating every day by countering the old narratives that strangle love everywhere and replaces it with lies and transactions. And through our organization, forming a cooperative network and community where we can get back to building relationships as the foundation of a new system altogether. So reach out. Let's do it. We are the ones we've been waiting for. All of this is a labor of love. So please support us on Patreon and help us make it happen. And go deeper into what the world on the other side of capitalism looks like with our shows and videos. I cannot wait for y'all to see this movie. It's been an incredible adventure to take on the whole world with great people like Rick Wolf. It's the story of all of us who have been broken down by this system and every one of us who knows a better world is possible.